Is that the reason that you prefer to do it on your own? Very much so. Uh, I'm more conservative than she is, and I like to be able to buy my pinstripe suits. I must have six pinstripe suits of different colors, and that's what I like. We are watching a seldom seen ritual of modern corporate marketing. The men beyond the glass are the subjects of minute scrutiny. What are their habits? What makes them feel comfortable? What, in short, will make them want to buy a new product that the world's largest apparel manufacturer is preparing to sell? To them and to you. This week on Enterprise, Levi's not by genes alone. I'm Eric Severide, and I predate the blue jean era. When I was young, they were worn only by farmers and laborers. They were work clothes. In the 1950s, the image of jeans began to change. Marlon Brando and James Dean wore them as symbols of rebellion. In the 60s, jeans emerged as a uniform of a generation, receiving a priceless seal of disapproval when they were banned from schools around the country. At about that time, Levi Strauss and Company began its rather lucky rise to the top of its industry. Today, it's the world's largest clothing manufacturer. But with over 500 million pairs of jeans now in the collective American wardrobe, and competition from designer jeans of, of all things, the market is both saturated and changing. This week on Enterprise, we will watch Levi Strauss attempt to end its dependence on dungarees before the fashion fad of the century begins to fade away. San Francisco, home of Levi Strauss and Company, the largest apparel manufacturer in the world. In 1980, Levi grossed $2.8 billion, over 50% from jeans. Levi recently produced its two billionth pair of jeans. Sales have grown an average of 23% each year for the last decade. But no corporation believes in limits to growth. Staying the same size is commercial blasphemy. The jeans market is saturated. For Levi, the question is, what next? This is Peter Haas, Jr., Harvard MBA, son of Levi's chief executive officer and the great-great-grandnephew of Levi Strauss himself. In June of 1980, Haas became general manager of a new marketing division, created specifically to introduce the most expensive and formal clothing ever to carry the Levi name. How many are we... The marketing director for launching the new product is Steve Goldstein. Goldstein, Yale 61, has marketed everything from ultrasonic plastic welding equipment to liquid yogurt to cold capsules. He's been with Levi for five years. Haas and Goldstein are charged with extending Levi Strauss and Company's name into a different and lucrative segment of the menswear market. Levi's is in all kinds of businesses today. We make shirts, hats, socks, belts, skirts, blouses. All of them are in moderate price points. If we want to grow, we're probably going to have to go to upper moderate price points and somewhat higher taste levels for our products. In order for a company like Levi Strauss uh, to extend its sales and profit growth, we need to diversify, to develop new products. And this is a lot more difficult than it was when we were just filling demand for a five-pocket Western jean. Filling an existing need is one thing. Uncovering new needs is another. Levi Strauss has spent millions attempting to predict consumer behavior. Haas and Goldstein's new product is not based on hunch, but on an extensive market segmentation study involving over 2,000 consumer interviews. We took apart the men's uh, market about 18 months ago and examined five basic segments within it. And we really understood what's going on within each one of those five segments. Uh, the Q3 segment we call the utilitarian jeans customer. This guy is our old familiar Levi's loyalist. He doesn't care much about clothes and he wears jeans for work and for play. He's a big chunk of the men's apparel market, about 26%. Uh, Q4, um, we call trendy casual. He's basically your John Travolta type. He buys high fashion brands. He loves to be noticed. He may wear jeans to work, but he really comes to life after dark. 
The Q4 occupies 19% of the market. The Q5 customer we've all seen is a price shopper. His main concern is the price of his goods. He shops at department stores and discount stores, wherever the bargains are best. Then we come to the two largest segments uh, of the pie. The Q1, um, our mainstream traditionalist. The Q1 loves polyester. He's probably over 45 years old, married, a hardcore department store shopper. Most likely, he's a conservative, both in his political views and in his tastes. He likes to shop with his wife, and he values her opinion. He really is the heart of our Levi's Action Slack and Levi's Action suit business, which at the moment uh, makes up a good portion of all of the sales for the menswear division. The most significant thing about the menswear uh, segmentation study uh, was the uncovering of this Q2 segment. We call it the, uh, the classic independent. The classic independent is a fascinating animal. He's a real clothes horse. He spends more on his clothes than any other group. He buys 46% of the wool and wool blended clothing sold, yet he's only 21% of the market. Looking right is real important to him. His dress is traditional. Lapels are never too wide and never too narrow. He really likes to shop, and he really likes to shop alone, not with his wife or his girlfriend. He knows what he likes, and he goes to specialty stores to buy it. We're going after this guy uh, tooth and nail. And the bait? A full line of tailored clothing for men. Slacks, sport coats, and most notably, three-piece suits. The suits will be sold as separates. Jacket, slacks, and vest can be selected by the customer in his correct size, eliminating the need for tailoring. The cut will be traditional, not faddish. The fabrics will be wool and wool blends in conservative colors and patterns. Thirty to forty-five dollars for the slacks, eighty-five to a hundred for the jackets, and the three-piece suit will retail for about one hundred sixty dollars. Just what the target consumer, the Q2, should be looking for. The man in charge of design and production of the new line is Steve Schwartzbach, a garment industry veteran from New York. In August 1980, one year before Levi's Tailored Classics will be in the stores, Schwartzbach brings samples from other manufacturers to serve as models for prototype garments. Are you going to make this, this garment? Yeah, that's one. Okay. Now we want a belt loop garment, which is basically the Todd, mm -hmm. okay, except that we want to drop the watch pocket. No watch so it's pocket. a Todd. Well, I shouldn't say it's a Todd because actually there's n no uh, simulated top stitching. Right. A vital part of Levi's strategy is selling in department stores for volume sales, not in specialty stores where Q2 consumers habitually shop. The sales manager for Tailored Classics, George McGoldrick, has the formidable task of selling this new approach to department store buyers. The success of the line rests ultimately on the shoulders of McGoldrick and his 12 salesmen. Well, the sales force is extremely excited. Uh, they've been very antsy to get going with this concept, and uh, they know we have something that's good, potentially going to be some very large business down the road to come. In 1850, a television commercial will be crucial to the campaign but the message will need to be very different from the casual image that has appealed so successfully to the Q3 segment, the jeans wearers. These ads mirrored the values held by young consumers in the 70s, nonconformity and doing your own thing. There was a stranger who came into our town. He was tall and had eyes that could look right to the bottom of you. Yeah, we're different, you and I, but aren't we different the same? 
The commercial for tailored classics must be ready for September of 81 to coincide with the introduction of the line. It will be carefully designed to appeal to the Q2 consumer. It will definitely not have a woman in the commercial, along with him as a, as a support for, uh, for his purchase. That would antagonize this guy. We know that. Uh, he doesn't want to have somebody telling him that he looks good or he doesn't look good. There's an awful lot of, of research under underlayment that has to go on, and it is that's going on right now. He's a Q2. He's a real true Q2. The other guy's a Q1 plus or Q2 minus guy. In November 1980, the Tated Classics marketing team gathers behind a one-way glass to watch their target consumers being interviewed. Buy most of your clothes on your own, or yeah. part of the statements, in fact, that you were, I think you were read out over the phone was uh, whether you prefer to shop on your own. I or prefer to shop on my own, but I don't always have the choice I want. <laughs> <laughs> The discussion leader is Malcolm Baker, an independent research consultant. The consumers are paid $20 to participate. They all match the Q2 profile in a preliminary telephone interview. My wife and I don't agree on, on yeah. what I should wear very often. I is, that, like is that the reason that you prefer to do it on your own? Very much so. Uh -huh. And uh, I'm more conservative than she is. And I like to be able to buy my pinstripe suits. I must have six pinstripe suits of different colors, and that's what I like. Goldstein and advertising manager Leslie Schumann have arranged consumer discussions known as focus groups in New York and Atlanta, as well as here in San Francisco. The basis of the discussion is a um, fairly new concept in men's clothing. This is a full line of traditionally styled men's suits, slacks and blazers, made of a natural and blended fabric. The clothes are reasonably priced, and they require no tailoring. What are your reactions to that? There's a big difference between something that you take off the rack and something that you can have a little something done to. If you can spend $30 for something you can walk out of the store with, but if you can spend 45 and have them do a little tailoring on it, it looks terrific on you, spend $15 more and look like something. You're worth it. Mm -hmm. Are you damn right? The other guys do not want to feel mass-produced. If they are mass-produced, it's the last thing they want to be reminded of. <coughs> that was they're willing to put it on but, and compromise at the rack, but they don't want to be told that they can, fit, they can be fitted just like millions of others. Right. It's in their minds that it can't be done, so it goes back to the ritual significance of having a tailor there and making a few adjustments that make it your own thing, so that your blue pinstripe is your blue pinstripe, mm -hmm. and it's not the same as mine. Well, we should stress the idea that in our separates, we can make the top Sure for you. A suit for you because the top fits your top and our bottom fits your bottom. Okay, the final peel away tells us that this line of clothing will be made by Levi. The party-like atmosphere in the booth changes abruptly. The use of the Levi name is a critical issue. So the idea of Levi producing a line of traditionally styled men's slacks and blazers that works, does it? You you feel that Levi would do that well? The travel agent is not so sure, is it? I think Levi, I, you know, I think jeans. Yeah. And if they're making suits, I would have to be convinced. What about a jacket? Slacks are okay. And what about blazers? The sort of thing that Jack is wearing. Um, would you I, see? I don't believe that, that would be hard. That would be easier to convince me than suits. We hear the same thing. Yeah, over this and over. Be right. Really, it's got to be right. Well, it's this slacks and blazers are the way to start. Right. While consumer research continues, George McGoldrick is on the road presenting the concept of tailored classics to retailers. Stores need to place orders by February to ensure delivery in August, and the salesmen are eager to get started. The only concern they have right now is, is one of price. We're going into a, a tough year economically, and uh, we're hoping that the consumer will see the value of our garment and be willing to pay the price. We don't think we're going to have that much of a problem selling it to the retailer. In early December, a sample from the factory is ready for approval by Steve Schwartzbach. Does it feel big on you? Well, yeah, it feels large on me. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I have an awful lot of room. I, I, think, the middle. 
I think the front of the coat is a little big. The back seems to be. The back is perfect. Yeah, I, I think, think, I think uh, we have to take that front end a little bit. If you were in the market for a navy blue pinstripe suit and you made these adjustments, you think that could be something you'd be inclined to buy? Absolutely. Sure. No problem at all. You in the market for a navy blue pinstripe Always suit? Always in the market. <laughs> <laughs> but it's not just any navy blue pinstripe suit. It's a Levi suit. And consumer perception of the Levi name is a prime topic when the Tailored Classics team meets for a debriefing with the focus group leader. We had people saying, well, if I, I mean, I, if I wore a suit and I went to work and, and someone said to me, hey, that's a nice suit, Joe, well, whose suit is it? And I said, Levi. Um, I would not feel comfortable. And I think it has, it has a lot to do with, with, with image and with, and with convention, rather than the belief that Levi is not capable of making a suit that would function perfectly well and that would look all right. So you're saying that maybe they would feel very comfortable about wearing it as long as they put someone else's label in it? Yes. Yes. What does that lead you in terms of where we, what we should be doing in terms of that? How, well, my the message or... or I can talk, I, I've got to talk about message in a minute, but my rec basic recommendation at the moment is lead with slacks and sports coats and let suits um, slipstream um, is with, with the Levi image as it, as it currently is with this segment, however positive, I think the image is still a little too casual. You're absolutely right. The thing that's going to overcome the Levi's image for casualness, as no other thing can do, is a suit that's made by Levi that doesn't look like all the other stuff we've made. And once that gets in on the shelves or on the racks, uh, there are going to be a lot of people who will put a, a little asterisk on the Levi's image which says, oh, and also they, they can make a, a good suit when they, when they put their mind to it. December 15th, the selling of Levi's tailored classics begins. Schwarzbach presents the line to buyers from Weinstock's department stores. Continuing along in the same vein is our expression twill. Stretch, brushed, done in a whole host of colors, including basics. After the buyers have shown the entire tailored classics line, the talk turns to Levi's wholesale prices. Here, here, yeah. and here you're talking $15.90 for the slack and you're talking $43 for the coat. Here, here. The wholesale prices are higher than wine stocks had anticipated. Retail prices will need to follow suit big jump for the customer or last year we were at $28 on this slack <clears throat> I just I have to be leaving in a couple of minutes I just wanted to come in and find out uh, any observations or questions that Pete Haas is acutely aware that tailored classics are priced higher than the competition he is beginning to feel nervous about his first new product launch with the company and is anxious for firm commitments to buy when do you think you'll be uh, uh, be giving us paper, um, actually making a selection in order, just so that we know. Within 30 days, I would say, Jeff, you'll be finished up with all the Would it be all before then, do you think? After the yeah. set, essentially by right February 1st. Okay. No! you got to get a new suit by Saturday. No problem. Levi's Tailored Classics is not the only game in town. A very similar line of clothes is offered by Hager. Introducing Hager Imperial Separates for the no problem suit in 100% wool and wool blend. Hager's ad is not aimed at the Q2, but at the more casual dresser who needs a suit for special occasions. No! No! And Hager speaks from experience. We've been in this business since 1926. <clears throat> We make all of our own products. We control our quality. And our track record, unlike our friends that you mentioned, they're a fine firm, but they were making another type of product, completely different from what they're making. Levi's venture into finer clothing is certainly a risk, and initial sales are not encouraging. After months of optimism, doubts begin to surface. I think about this a lot. Oh, you do? Yeah. I dream about it. Yeah, no, I don't dream about it, but I do think about it. And that is, um, we really have one shot at this. I mean, everything we do relative to this line has to be right. Everything. I mean, if we could only Hundreds get... Hundreds of thousands, thousands of retailers and right. consumers who are staying the doors down. January 5th, 1981. 
McGoldrick is having a tough time. Money is tight, department stores are cautious, and the salesmen are getting discouraged. Okay, listen, as much as we need to book those goods, I think you still have to get to Detroit. We've got to, we've got to get placement in Detroit right away. You can, call, you can call Dayton from there. And if they're not willing to give you paper right away, then, then maybe I can call and maybe next week I'll even come in. Despite slow sales, pattern layout and cutting begin at the factory in San Antonio. Levi's contract with Burlington Mills gives option dates by which additional fabric must be ordered. If sales don't improve soon, the February 1st option will not be exercised. By late January, the sales picture is worse. Two of McGoldrick's sales reps have quit the line. They aren't selling enough to make their commissions. High prices are blamed, and McGoldrick is feeling frustrated. Well, I think it's a, a lot of emotions from, from wanting to punch someone in the mouth to, to wanting to leave and never come back. Hello? Hey, Mike. How you doing? I would spend a day here or spend a week on the road and come home and, and get a call at 11 o'clock at night. You know, damn it, I can't do this, I can't do that. You know, this one's throwing me out, I want to leave, you know, and then you got to sit now calm down and you end up talking to people uh, half the night to keep them going because they have to get up and go out the next day. Okay. Listen, pal, you're number two in the whole region. You've done a phenomenal job. You've been thrown out of accounts before. We all have. Yeah. Listen, this is one tough season. Something had to be done. On the morning of January 29th, after much debate, Pete Haas made a desperate move. Daily News Record, the trade paper of the garment industry, carried the news. Wholesale prices were dropped 4 to 7 percent, and McGoldrick took immediate action. The biggest department store in the United States is, is Bambergers, which is part of the Macy organization. They, I knew, were going to pass us, and they are big. They were going to Dallas, Texas to work with, with our competition and place orders. And the day that Pete got authority to roll back the prices, I caught a 1 a.m. plane to Dallas found these people in their hotel eating breakfast at 7 in the morning, 10 minutes before our competition sent the limousine to pick them up and, and save the day. I felt like uh, the cavalry, you know, kind of, but uh, they flew right from Dallas to San Francisco and they gave us about, good golly, it must have been three, four hundred thousand dollars worth of, of goods. March 10th, the first selling season is over. The Tailored Classics team flies to Los Angeles for the menswear trade show called Magic. Magic is an opportunity for thousands of manufacturers and retailers to get together to display new products, to make deals, and to celebrate sales successes. Sing a song. Sing it loud. Hager had done well. Sales of their Imperial line had more than tripled in the past year. But the Tailored Classics team is not celebrating. Despite the price rollback, they've achieved only 65% of their modest sales goals. Tailored Classics are not being prominently displayed at Levi's exhibit. The emphasis in the menswear division has shifted to a new line of washable polyester suits. This line is seen by Levi's senior management as having more immediate profit potential. And, and, and it's not Bob Siegel, Pete Haas's boss, is losing confidence in tailored classics. He has canceled plans for the television commercial and put all research on hold. Haas and Goldstein are fighting to keep the line alive. One of the major stumbling blocks is the Levi name itself. The question of the, of the applicability of the name to better merchandise is an unknown. And we'll never know that by just talking to retailers. Never. 
and I'd like to get it out and get it settled. I'd like to find out that it can't be. That it doesn't work. That this does not work with the consumer. Upon returning from magic, they decide to confront the dissonance between a casual Western image and elegant clothing head on. The agency prepares an ad for the Sunday New York Times magazine for September okay. 81. Uh, Levi's Taylor Classics. You expected rivets, perhaps. I love the juxtaposition of a horse and an elegant man, and of you expected rivets, rivets perhaps because of Levi's, and and and, it and you have it confronts exactly. that issue directly. So the selling of Levi's Tailored Classics moves forward, but at a walk, not a gallop. There will be no big television commercial. But the newspaper ad will run in New York. They will feature a sport coat, not a suit. They will try to gradually warm up retailers to their ideas and await the verdict from the consumer. I would be much happier if, if uh, this new business of ours had taken off and flown brilliantly. But, you know, that's, that's business. Most new products fail. Most new products fail one feels a responsibility, would have liked to have done uh, better than we did, uh, would have liked to have had 2020 foresight instead of 2020 hindsight. I don't see how we can come in like the Messiah and teach people how to make money that nobody else can, because we're new in the business, too. But I think this, that if you never take a chance, you can never have a success. You win some and you lose some. In July, 81, George McGoldrick resigned after 16 years with Levi Strauss. He was unhappy with trying to sell better clothing with the Levi name. He is now a national sales manager at RPM, a pants manufacturer in New York. Pete Haas has a new position. He has been assigned to the office of Levi's chief operating officer. Steve Schwartzbach now has primary responsibility for tailored classics. It's really his baby now. Steve Goldstein has been spending considerable time marketing the washable polyester suits. He is every bit as enthusiastic about that as he was about tailored classics. I can get enthusiastic about almost anything, you know. I can get enthusiastic about a cheeseburger. As of November 1981, consumer response to Levi's tailored classics is mixed. Sport coats and slacks are selling well, but suit separates are moving slowly. This program was presented by WGBH-TV, which is solely responsible for its content.